photography. Scooch over. Here we go. Scooch over. Scooch over. 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 Okay. Hello, everyone. How are you? We're going to sing a song together. Kids, just wave and get it over with, okay? Hi! Okay, stop. Now, where, 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 where are we done waving? Okay, that's good. Thanks. Would you help us practice by leaning with us? You First you need to lean this way. Then you need to lean this way. Then you probably need to lean this way again. You know, follow along. Sing out. Help us when you can, okay? Here we go. Ready? You guys did great. Good job, kiddos. Off to Sunday school. If you're going to Sunday school, if you're going to find your mom, go give your mom a hug and then go to Sunday school. Give your friends a hug and then go to Sunday school. Bye, guys. Okay, another hug. Okay. All right, and Sunday school is 10 minutes later. Hugs are good. All right, um, the announcements are in your bulletin, and I'd be happy to read the announcements to you if you would like. Yeah. You can read? All right, the choir says they can read. You guys can read the announcements. Th special things going on, Veterans Day, so be sure. If you haven't already, 
uh, re submitted your picture for um, veterans. If you haven't already submitted your pictures, please do, do so right away. And there's Rake and Run, and we're going to have special um, things that watch that night. So come for the meal. And uh, Spirit Change for Smiles is the uh, Club 56 is doing a special deal where if you see them at the doors and they got a little jar and they say smiles for Club 56, you know, put your spare change in there. Or if you don't have it, don't, don't worry about it, but bring your spare change the next week. They'll be there again. Those are the announcements. Kiddos want to come. We got more children singing and they're not jumping though. and sing along. Let's turn now to our first hymn, This is My Father's World.
lots of reading. Who we are, God, that you have brought us this far. You have blessed our homes and our church. You provide bread to satisfy our hunger, and keep us day by day in your covenant. You have spoken to us in words of promise and placed a lighted lamp on our way. You have granted us wisdom and insight into the mystery of your will. Let us explore together what this means for our daily lives and for our church. We seek to know God's to receive our morning tithes and offerings, what shall, we re what shall we return to God for grace so freely given and love so lavishly bestowed? Let us extend spiritual blessings we have received to the poor in our midst. Let us feed the hungry and find ourselves fed in ways beyond our imagining. Tisn't my Lord delivered Daniel, delivered Daniel, delivered Daniel. Tisn't my Lord delivered Daniel, and why not every every man? Tisn't my Lord delivered Daniel, Daniel. From the belly of the whale, and the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, and why not every man? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Oh, 
opportunity to give out of the many blessings that you have given to us. Thank you for feeding us with your word and your love. And may we go out into the world nourishing others, giving them the word that you have given to us, loving them as you have loved us. May we go and do likewise. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. It's time uh, to pray together um, in a time of this service and we want to remember uh, those that uh, have been in the hospital and those that are recovering at home. But we also want to lift up the families of Lenora Fort and Helen Roberts. Uh, funerals will be coming up in the next few days and weeks. And um, that sounds weird. The next few days, the, the memorial service is in a couple of weeks for Lenora. That's why we're not like projecting things. Um, and the flowers back here are for um, Flory, uh, Flory and Noreen Davis, so 45 years. Let us uh, be in a time of prayer together. Lord, you are holy, and you provide a holy space for us to worship you. We give you thanks. We thank you for your spirit that's here amongst us and in us. We ask that you would fill our spirits with yours. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Remember that we are remembering the men on their men's retreat this day, and they're worshiping together also this morning. We ask blessing upon them. Bless blessing upon those that are recovering at home, those that have been in the hospital. We ask for healing to continue. Physical healing, but also spiritual healing within each of us, for we are all broken. Lord, we lift up to you those that are grieving. And we ask special blessing upon their families, and we ask that you would just walk along beside them in these days ahead, that you will give them your, your peace, hold them in your arms. Lord, we not only do we lift up our prayer concerns, but we also lift up our joys, the joy of the sunshine, the joy of, of fullness that you have given to us, the joy of anniversaries and special days in our lives. The joy of this Sunday, of being able to gather together. Lord, you bless us in so many ways. We thank you. We love you. You are holy. 
Lord, you ask us not just to sit here, but then to go out into the world to carry the message that you have given to us. Help us to be bold with that message. Help us to be encouraged this day. We thank you for Reverend Yankee. We ask blessing upon him, upon his ministry, and upon his message this day. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for things that we have done, but also your forgiveness for things that we should have done and haven't. We ask that you would take away our sin and cleanse us, make us whole, make us in right relationship with you. Come and fill our hearts. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and taught his disciples to pray together as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have a couple of really delightful privileges this morning. The first is to introduce to you the Reverend Aaron Yankee, uh, who is the current superintendent of the Gompa District in the Liberia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. We've had a partnership arrangement with that district, and uh, we're very glad to have him here. Uh, he'll be preaching to you in a moment. He's been with Kathy and me for several days now, and we'll be several more, and then we're going up to the annual Liberia Summit for the United Methodist Church up in Detroit later in the week. So, Aaron, if you'll come up. And then secondly, we have a wonderful organization within our congregation called the United Methodist Men. Uh, among their projects is the uh, script table that you may see out here where you can buy script and then profits come there. And uh, we've had some people who've wondered what that goes for. And uh, I'll let you make the presentation and we can talk about that. Uh, this last Tuesday, uh, Pastor Al and put out a uh, plea. Uh, the school over in uh, Saco mm -hmm. uh, does not have a church uh, school office. So uh, with that plea, they are building the office and they asked for some help with furnishing it. And we were able to come up with the uh, scripts that you folks have purchased throughout the year uh, has made our treasury to the point that we could fully pay for the office's furnishings, $750. <laughs> and before I turn it over to, to Aaron, um, we have reserved the side room at the, at the pizza ranch about 12.15 today, and we invite any of you to come and uh, eat with us and, and to um, talk with Aaron and to get to know more about what's going on over in Liberia, the kinds of ministries that we are supporting there. So, Thank you. all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, let me say it again. Um, praise the Lord is adoring God, praising the name of God. In our context, we say praise the Lord for two reasons. First, to praise God, and second, to get off our attention together as we preach. So please bear with me when I say each time praise the Lord, just amen. keep saying amen. Let us pray. 
Gracious Lord, we thank you. You are good. We cannot measure your goodness unto us. You love us so much, Lord. Even then we love ourselves. Be glorified through this message and let your people be moved to act in bringing your kingdom here on earth and transforming this world for you, Jesus. We thank you now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, let me bring you greetings from the Liberia Honor Conference of the United Methodist Church, and particularly from the Gomba District, where I serve as a district superintendent, and from my own family, my wife and children, and from all of our loving people of the Gompa District Conference. And let me say it again that I'm glad and overwhelmed to be here because it has been a time that I've been seeing some of you back in Liberia who came up for a visit, including Reverend Newhawk and other people when uh, Reverend Paul Wallace were here. They all came over to Liberia to visit our conference. And I want to appreciate you for the good work you've been doing and being part of our ministry. The Second Bay Church that just received this check was completed by you, was built and completed by you, and also the school. And you still support the school. I know recently you sent us some funds to pay our teachers, which were uh, very good and timely because we have just re we are just started recovering from the Ebola crisis, and uh, teacher salary became a challenge for the school. And each time the principal would call me, and well, blessing there for us, you were able to give us that phone, and we settled our teachers. Amen. Amen. But uh, we take, we've taken over just at the crucial point of our uh, country history, our church history in Liberia. As you may all know, last year, 2014, was a year of some serious health crisis in our country in terms of the Ebola outbreak. We, t we claimed the life of all over 4,000 persons. And because the sickness was a new disease to the country, to continue it was difficult. Many of our health workers didn't know what the sickness was. And so some of them died of it, doctors and nurses inclusive. Many of, some of our church members also died. I remember a lady who died, she was a nurse, she and I went to high school, graduated, went to university together. Her mother is presently the lay leader of our church. She was called Leson, that's, that's a Liberian language name. Leson meaning woman will. And Leson died last year, and that struck the whole church. It was saddening. Besides that, in Guinea, we lost one of our lay leader's wife. It was saddening. But then, um, not only the death had a Ebola cause for Liberia, it had left behind some sky that we try to heal. Today, our hospital is down in terms of drugs, Equipment, three nurses. I just spoke about the other health center we have in Guinea. I doesn't have a male wife. And so whenever women are in labor and they are taken to the health center, uh, we, they have nothing to do. They have to transfer that woman either to Ganta or to the nearby city called Zerikuri. And that has been a serious challenge for us. Uh, because of the ch 
challenges we have at the Ganta Hospital, the hospital was forced to lay off some workers to reduce staffs. And some of the staff already started leaving because the salary was not attractive. And so because of that, we do not have many of the trained nurses we have left. And most of our health workers at the hospital, most of them are nurse aides. And you know what nurse aides does. They do not do a lot of the work trained nurse will do or a doctor will do. They also left our school with so many problems, especially so kids. Many of our kids are not in school because the Ebola cause, it did not only cause health problem, it also caused economic problem. When the Ebola came, business, businesses were closed down, company stopped operation and some of them left. And so that means some of the parents are out of job. Um, some government offices close. Government had to send some civil servant home for that whole year as a way of continuing the spread of the Ebola. And so for a whole year, some parents they didn't work and they didn't get the kind of salary deserved for them to sustain their family. And so in our school. Kids will come around, but will not have the phone to erode at the school. And we being leader in that gap, in that situation, they sometimes walk to our, uh, to our house, our offices, and ask us to help. And again, we help in our own little strength. Like in my house now, I'm hosting three other boys who do not have the support, the opportunity to go to school. And they came, they asked me. Uh, first, I gave them, I, I introduced them to our school principal to see how, what kind of help we can offer. But later on, it occurred to me that they didn't have, they didn't have the, only the need for school, but they also had the need for shelter and food. So in our, at our personage, we had to make an extension, create an extension to host them and to also provide for them. So we have additional three person adding to our family. Now in Africa sometimes it's, we see it easily done. It's easy in Africa to, to dress one side of your bed and allow your kori to lie before you. Yeah, we try to give that kind of accommodation. And so we, that's where we are, that's there where we are, and many of our kids are actually because the, some of the people who, who died, their kids are around. Even though in Africa we have some of what we call the extended family, some of them have gone on to extended family, maybe those extended families are providing some food for them, but education is still a challenge for some of, most of them. And so doing our children's service, they will come around, and after service they will like wait around to see who they can talk to. And most of the time the people they, they look out to talk to are the pastors. And it's very sad in our time. Our pastors, many of our pastors in the district are struggling people because where we have the Gompa district, Reverend Newhart knows and other people, we are at the interior part of Liberia, far in the north east of the country. And that part of the country, many of the pastors who go to the seminary will not want to be assigned in that place because when you are assigned there, you don't have that salary you may need to sustain yourself. And so most of our pastors that we have a sign in that place are pastors who are lay pastors who do not have seminary training and they make a sacrifice to serve the church. Like I was saying yesterday to the men, I don't know how many of your pastors in the United States who have not finished high school.
But back there, we got pastors who are not finished high school because of the way our school system is organized. For example, if a pastor is in, if a man is in the, or person is in this village, this village only had junior high. And if he start his school from the elementary and then complete the junior high, he had to like move from here to Geneseo, to the next town, to continue the high school. So if he doesn't have the opportunity to move on, then it means that his education stops at junior high. And so that's the reason why we have some of our pastors who have not finished high school. And those ones who have completed high school have the hard desire to go to the seminary to learn and be trained. And again, we are struggling with raising up funds for them to go to the seminary. But we want to be grateful to the Morton Church for the many things. I worked with Reverend Labla for almost seven years before, eight years before I began district superintendent. He and I worked closely. I worked with him as program coordinator of the district. I worked with him as a youth coordinator. And later I was assigned to the Guinea Mission. But praise be to God that your heart, your hearts were led Liberia mission to support the Second Period Church and you started being, uh, building for us a youth center but the unfortunate part of the uh, story of that center is that when we were going through the Ebola crisis while, while people were stationed and people sitting and not moving criminal broke into the center it was just about finish and to dedicate the criminal broke in took off all of the electric electrical wires, the socket, the switch, the receptacle, the, the inside doors, and some of the windows. Yeah, everything was took, taken off and then it's like, it's a great setback for us. And so that's why we have now moved to the youth center. But I was just telling Reverend Newhall that we pray and hope that this year, before the year ends, we can move there. It's necessary that we move there and our presence be felt. I think that by that we'll be able to scare away the criminals. But um, let me, on this note, let me bring, draw our attention to the test and what we have today as a message from God. I want us to look at the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 1 to 11. The Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 11. And I'm going to read that. It says, After these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine. But there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for this harvest, for his harvest. Go, be aware. Go, be warned, though, that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Carry no wallet, no bag, and no sandals. Do, don't even greet anyone along the way. Whenever you enter a house, first say, may peace be on this house. If anyone dare share God's peace, then, you, then your peace will rest, upon, will rest on that person. If not, your peace blessing will return to you. Remain in this house, eating, drink, eating and drinking whatever they set before you, for workers deserve their pay. Don't move from house to house. Whenever you enter a city and its people welcome you, eat what they set before you. Heal the sick, 
who are there and they and say to them, God's kingdom has come upon you. Whenever you enter a city and the people, do, the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of your city that has collected that has collected on our feet, but not, but know this, God's kingdom has come to you. I assure you that Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off on judgment day than that city. The words of God for the children of God. Surely, let me say to all of us, let me talk to all of us on the team, God needs men and women. This text or this book has been my favorite gospel since I came into the preaching ministry, since I came to be pastor. Among the four gospels, I love the book of Luke. Because Luke, own story, as he presents it, is open, is inclusive, and it, it brings everybody on board. Like the beginning of this book, when Lou all learned the story, the, 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 the beginning of the, the ancestors of Jesus Christ, it goes way, way back as far as Adam's time. And he narrates it all the way to Joseph and Mary. Unlike, Luke, unlike Matthew, who was begin with Abraham. Hmm? In other words, Matthew is concerned about one race or one set of people, but Luke is inclusive and presenting Jesus to be the savior of the world. Eh? Not the savior of one group of people. And so that's why I love Luke. So in this test, this story had, I think, three of several versions in the different Gospels. In Matthew's account, it says that Matthew, uh, Jesus sent out 12 disciples. 12 Jewish disciples, let me say that. And he commanded them not to go to the Gentile, but to the lost Sheep of Israel. Hmm? So if I in Africa and he read this Matthew account, I'll say, okay. That whole thing about Jesus Christ is not my concern. Because I am not part of the lost sheep of Israel. I am part of the lost sheep of Africa. And so maybe the test is not for me. But then, when you come to Luke, Luke brings everybody together. And so, when I was reading through, I selected the Luke test to talk on. But Jesus has given us the command. But before then, Jesus has had conversation with some other guys in chapter 9 of this book, Luke. Starting with 50, verse 57 to 62. Some guys who came out to, to volunteer and even some of them that Jesus asked to follow him. And through the conversation, Jesus had to lay out some of the requirements. That you, some of the, or, or the requirements or the qualifications you need to have in order to be his disciples. And so he told the first man who said, I want to follow you. That foxes have who? Birds of the air have nets. But the son of man have nowhere to lay his head. And then another guy came. He said, Lord, I want to follow you. But please let me go back to bury my father. 
And like I said, burying father in that sin didn't imply that that young man or that gentleman father was already lying there somewhere that he had to rush there. But it's a contest in our African setting when you are the first boy or the first man born in the family, it is your responsibility to bury your father. And so, whenever you are advancing in life and doing things, you always have to keep around until if that old man is dead, you bury him and then maybe you can explore outside the world. And so I think it's in that context that God was talking to Jesus. And so he had to tell him, please allow me to bury So in that sense, Jesus, following Jesus doesn't call for delay. Because when he said, let me go and bury my father was like going to take some more years to wait for the old man. Maybe the old man was just about 60 years. And God had given that old man to live up to 100 years. So he's going to wait for 40 years. Huh? He's going to wait for another 40 years so that his father can die, bury him. Hey, Jesus, did he come? Did Jesus stay here over 40 years? No. 33 years. So he's not going to follow Jesus. So Jesus told him, let the dead bury the dead. And another guy came up. So, Lord, I will follow you. Okay? He said, but please, let me go back and tell my people goodbye. He said, okay, but let me tell you this. He who follow me and keep looking back, or who, he who puts the hands into the plow and keep looking back, it's not worth it to be my disciple. That conversation went on, and after that, in the test in chapter 10, Jesus recruited recruited 10 or uh, 72 persons to send them out into places they were about to go. To go and preach. To go and tell them about the kingdom of God. And he said, one key thing I want to live up. He said, don't greet, don't even greet anyone on the road. Uh, if you are not careful, you will say Jesus is commanding or instructing the disciples to be unfriendly. To be unfriendly people on their mission. But what this implies to me is that the mission, the disciple making of Jesus Christ doesn't, doesn't call for distraction. You must not be distracted. When you are going to do this work, you have to be focused. Hmm? Men and I, we go, we are tempted when we go out to tell, to preach or to spread the gospel, we are tempted in putting the Bible on one side and talk best friend story. Eh? Sometimes, right? When we are sent out to go and talk about Jesus Christ, sometimes we fall off the Bible and talk best friend story. Old time story, right? And that distraction. So Jesus said, don't even greet anyone on the way. But I look at this test as the pre-great commission that Jesus expressed in Matthew 28 and also in, in Acts chapter 1. In Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, he said to the disciples, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things I have taught you, and I will be with you to the end of the time. And that statement of Jesus Christ, I will be with you to the end of time, has become one of my strengths in ministry. And so whenever I I was given new assignment. I don't know the environment. I don't know where I'm going. Like for example, 2011, even though I went to Guinea previously as refugees, but this time I'm not going as a refugee. I'm going as preacher of the gospel. I'm going to a country that, that have language different. 
In Liberia, we speak English. In French, uh, in Guinea, that's French. With other 24 other local languages. But then when I took the assignment in 2011, my wife said, wow, I'm going to, going to tell Bishop that we are not going there. <laughs> I said, no, baby, let, just leave that alone. We will, we will deal with that. And we prayed about it. We went in. But I've read Matthew 28. And Jesus had promised me that I should go. He would be with me. And so when I'm going, whenever it's tough, and when I reach to a bridge that I cannot cross, I get down on my knee, like I'm looking over my shoulder and saying, Lord, you told me that you will be with me. You got to show up. And in many instances, he show up and I cross. The first time I went to Guinea and I was like, wow, how am I going to preach in this place? So I, I, I got to hire one interpreter. But then it happened that Guinea is a country such that the French language is official, but it's now widely spoken. So the people speak their local languages almost everywhere. And blessing them, one of the local languages in Guinea is also in Liberia, and I happen to be part of that local language in Liberia, and I speak that fluently. Praise the Lord. And so I said, okay. I think I can make it here. <laughs> and so, as I went out to preach, to communicate, I used our local, local languages. I didn't have to scream myself to look for an interpreter and to speak French. Even though later on, I started learning the French. But, the work is with us. God has commanded us to go. And in this Luke contest of selecting 72, giving me up the story of selecting 72 persons, gave me the clue that the disciple making aspect, the evangelistic aspect of the church is not only left to the pastors and the pastor staffs. I see it to also be the responsibility of all of us who have been called by Jesus Christ through our baptism. And so you can't say, oh, okay. It's just somebody is sick or somebody is crying and somebody is back there in the hospital bed and need prayer. And you are a member, you are a member of the Morton United Methodist Church and you close by there and you say, okay, I'm going to call the pastor. You can pray. In the same way, God hear the pastor, God can hear you. And God can change things because you pray. And so, for Matthew, Matthew selected 12 Jewish disciples to go. Jesus, I'll be saying, Luke said, Jesus selected 72 persons, missed people. Oh, it's not only pastor. The fact that you came before the altar during your baptism and make the baptism vow before God. That I can tell my people, it's not me, the pastor you're making a vow to. You make a vow to God. And so when you make that vow, you stand right in, in a place where God, you're telling God, here yeah, I am, send me. And so in the Acts text, Matthew said we should go and make disciples of all nations. In the Acts text, Jesus, um, Luke is specifying this area. He said in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the far end of the world. But many of us have not gone far. Many of us are still sitting in our little corner. I may refer to as our Jerusalem. Many of us are sitting in our little communities that I may refer to as our Jerusalem. And we don't care what happened across the road. What happened across the street. We have been for several years, we have lived in a community, some of us. We have not been able to cross the street next to us and tell somebody, Jesus loves you. And that person is, that person too, like somebody will say, is God's creation. That person too, Jesus died for him or her. 
That person need a good news. It's not done yet. But we are complacent many times in our situation. When things are better, we sit and look. But like, like I was telling uh, Reverend Nihal yesterday, the church moves in Liberia during the Ebola crisis, even though the, they were saying we should not stay close by. But the church used to be crying off. Nobody wants to die. Everybody, because God, everybody wants God that time. Because nobody wants to die. And so we have to split all our services into pieces so we can, we can abide by the government rule and also worship God. During the war, many people became Christians. But after the war, when things were kind, people relaxed. They didn't care. But God holds us responsible when we get all of the goods from Him. The goods of life, of joy, of happiness, of certainty for salvation. And we don't share that good with others who need them. You may see somebody walking and looking well and looking well off, healthy. But deep inside, they don't have peace like you have. Because I know that Jesus is our peace. Somebody, somewhere, need Jesus. And if that person has to know Jesus, it has to be through us. A preacher said we are the hands and the feet and the mouth of God. And we have to go into the Word and do God's work. But if we don't do, God sometimes has a own way of making us to do it. Like I tell you the story about my own country, the United Methodist Church came to Liberia in, in the 1800s, precisely 1833. And almost over 160 years we were sitting in Liberia enjoying Christianity, enjoying Methodism. But the country now, I'm talking about Guinea. Guinea is 85% Muslim. And the rest of the people are African traditional practices and things. Just about 10% Christianity with the statistics I got when I was there. With the one of my sister years plus, the United American Church had been just close to a river that you need to just, you need, you need to just cross over to Guinea. And in 1926, a missionary left from North Carolina and that missionary settled right by that river bank called Ganta and established a mission where he built a hospital, a school, a church, and all other things. And the church has stayed by that river bank for so many years. He hasn't crossed over to Guinea. And then 1994, God said this time, you like it or not, you will go to Guinea. Boom, the rebel attack. And everybody went helter skelter. And we were forced to cross that river. That normally we could not cross. We went over, we established a church, established clinic as refugees, established school, and the school have grown and providing education for over. 800 Guineans children almost every year. The clinic is providing health service. The church has grown up to 15 congregations. That's God's doing. Similar to what, uh, what happened in Jerusalem when Jesus said, Jesus has said already to the disciples to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the rest of the world. And after Jesus had ascended, they were still sitting in Jerusalem until Stephen was stoned to death and then Saul got on the wrong page arresting Christians one by one throwing them in, in jail and then when they look so because of that Samaria was able to get the gospel through Philip when we don't do it God has a own way of doing it 
But I want all of us to raise up our hands like the man called Isaiah when he prays in this temple. And God asked the question, who shall we send? Who shall go for us? And he raised up his hands. Lord, here I am. Send me. Can we raise up our hands today? And say, Lord, here I am. Send me. And I think there's a blessing when we raise up our hands to the call of God. And those of us who are raising up our hands, I just want you to stand up and pray for you. Those of you who have lift, raised up your hands, I want you to stand. Let me pray for you. Just raise up your hands to God. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your words. You have revealed to us this morning that it is not done yet until we reach to the end of the word. We know our home country is not the end of the word. There are other people beyond our bound, Lord, that need you, that need your good news. So help us, those of us who have raised up our hands this morning unto you, O God, that you will give us the heart, you will give us the mind, you will give us the strength, O God, in whatever way we will use Lord, to make you known to the rest of the world. Help us to give ourselves unto you. Help us to give our resources unto you. Help us to give you all that we are, O oh God, to make you new, to bring down your kingdom, and to make disciples for you, O oh Jesus Christ, for the transformation of this world. We thank you, O oh Lord. Be glorified now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. at this door uh, following our benediction hymn um, and also remember that you can come and have lunch with him uh, at the pizza ranch um, and so let's let's conclude today's service with singing on eagle's wing our benediction song <laughs>